thank you, thank you very much for, for that um, uh, kind introduction and for this invitation to be here this evening. It's an unusual type of situation for me as an academic to be speaking at, and it's a real privilege to be speaking uh, alongside the opening of these fabulous works by Richard Whitby and Webb Ellis that I think, as you've already heard, have all sorts of resonances with some of my own work, and I'll try and identify what some of those are. Um, when I was asked to come and speak this evening, um, Mirren mentioned that part of the theme was to do with the uh, occasion of Brexit, or the non-Brexit as it's turned out to be. So I thought I might try and connect some of the themes in my book directly to Brexit, and to look at how some of the arguments I make in the book uh, are playing out in Britain at the moment. Um, the um, book which came out uh, last year is, I'm sorry if some of this isn't so visible at the back, none of it's going to be so uh, important, but it's Nervous States. Um, and I'm going to try and uh, explain some of the um, main themes within the book. Um, but what was interesting about the opportunity to connect this back to Brexit was that the book began with Brexit, really. The book began on that extraordinary night of the 23rd of June 2016, when I'm sure we all have our own particular memories and experiences and emotions of that evening, or whether they found out what had happened in the morning. I, for my sins, stayed up pretty much all night with a bottle of whiskey and a Twitter account, um, gradually trying to assemble various thoughts, which became less and less coherent as the night went on. I've actually just recently deleted my Twitter account, but before I did so, I went back to see what I deleted, uh, what, I, um, uh, uh, what I tweeted at 4 a.m. on the 24th of June, and it was, it was this image uh, accompanied just by the words, it's happening, and this was uh, Nigel Farage at 4.02 a.m. Uh, seizing victory. Uh, which he'd earlier claimed he wasn't going to um, uh, attain. Um, I went to bed for uh, a couple of hours, and then the next day, I, uh, I suppose uh, psychoanalysts will tell you that intellectualism is a type of neurotic defence, uh, and I suppose rather kind of confused and overwhelmed by what the hell was going on in our country, I immediately tried to start to organise some of these thoughts into a kind of sociological, uh, theoretical account. Um, and this, what I wrote on the, 20th, the next day, turned out to actually have quite a profound impact on my, I suppose, my, my career as a writer, uh, led to many more people wanting to commission my writing, and wanting to read my writing than had previously done so. Um, I never realised this when I coined the title of this blog post, which was Thoughts on the Sociology of Brexit, which doesn't sound like it's going to be a big hit, but it sort of went extremely viral um, and ended up being translated into lots of languages. Um, and uh, uh, viewed uh, uh, far more than anything else I've ever written uh, to the point where at open days at Goldsmiths I had parents coming up to me saying, oh, you're the, you're the blog post guy. Um, <laughs> now, I just thought it might be interesting to just to go back to that blog post to see how some of the ideas that I developed kind of on the hoof, really, on the night of the 23rd, 24th of June developed because it was from this that uh, I started to develop a set of arguments that led to uh, the book Nervous States uh, and to some of what I want to say uh, over, the, uh, over the next sort of uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, and really all I did uh, as I tried to sort of piece these things together was to list five observations, uh, which I think in some ways are still quite germane to where we are today. The first was that the geography of Brexit reflects the crisis of the 1970s, not the crisis of the 2010s which was really a, an observation, I suppose, about where were some of these regions that had uh, voted intensely for Brexit, which seemed to uh, be expressing some kind of uh, anguish or sense of being left behind. Um, uh, those of you who can't see this, you, you're a fairly familiar image of the map of Brexit. And I think that although it's been rather exaggerated since, this emphasis on the deindustrialized parts of England and the former mining parts of England. Nevertheless, I think that there's, uh, uh, it's important to consider that precise geography of these uh, areas of the UK, particularly down the east coast of England, that uh, were the particularly intense pockets of feeling uh, that, this, uh, that, that, that needed an outlet in the form of the, uh, uh, the vote um, against the European Union. I think there's an interesting question there about 
what is the east-west divide within England as well, partly to do with this. The second observation I, I made was that handouts don't produce gratitude. And I think this was, again, one of the sort of most striking, um, sort of most jarring uh, shocks to many people who assumed that the Remain campaign was going to win, was that the European Union clearly benefits this country in all sorts of ways, uh, so surely people will fall into line behind their economic interests. Um, and most startling uh, was this particular graph that, again, I apologise that it's rather small, but what it shows is the uh, correlation between the areas of England, of the UK, that were most dependent on EU grants were also the same ones that had the strongest vote for leave. And the one where that is greatest, which is in the top right-hand corner, is uh, East Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. Um, and again, it's interesting, I think, to think about some of these particular areas and what it means to reject not only whatever the European Union might have represented, but the very command that one acts according to a particular set of rational economic interests. Um, the third was that Brexit was not fueled by a vision of the future in any sense, and I think that's <laughs> been played out fairly uh, decisively over the last two and a half years. The fourth, which was kind of crucial for, for the argument I developed in the book, was that we now live in the age of data, not of facts. Um, and one of the things that interested me in particular was partly the failure of some of the polling that uh, seemed to represent that uh, opinion was in certain sorts of, you know, as a matter of fact, pointed in one direction or another, but was not able to pick up um, some of the sentiment, some of the depth of feeling that was uh, distributed around the country. Um, and then the, finally, the final one was that the least enslaved nation in the European Union has just thrown off its shackles. Precis the argument being that not being a member of the euro, this seemed to be one of the least logical countries that would ever want to escape the clutches of Brussels. And this led uh, ultimately on to, um, to my book. But I think that there were three things that immediately struck me as important to do and which I tried um, to um, develop in the writing of my book. And I will lay out some of the ways in which uh, I've, I've tried to do that. The first is, I think we need to understand not just what aspects of the status quo are in crisis, it's quite easy to talk about the things that are in decline, the things that are falling to pieces, the things that seem to be on the wane in various ways, the things that we are post, post-truth, post all sorts of things. Um, but we also somehow must try and understand what is emerging, which is new, which is coherent, which has a logic of its own, uh, and not simply uh, mourn and, uh, uh, and, and um, track the demise of something. The second is that in tracking that new thing, whatever that new type of political logic is, we might need to see it as a synthesis between the extremely old and the extremely new. And I'll say a bit more about that in a bit. But in particular, I think what we're witnessing today are appeals to uh, quite old ideals of nationhood, of identity, um, and of common purpose. But at the same time, to some extent, these are being mobilized and being uh, uh, governed in certain respects by digital technologies of the 21st century. What those two aspects of our politics hold in common is that they are, in certain respects, sensory in their nature. They are about uh, a relationship of immediacy to the world, an ability to sense how others are, to be in touch with how others are, uh, and to generate communities of affect of a sort that perhaps a more rational politics is not able to do. Finally, I think that clearly knowledge and the status of experts and truth in this particular moment is absolutely crucial. And that has been uh, uh, recognized all along in the sense of what the hell is going on when experts are no longer being listened to. Uh, the famous quote that you'll probably all remember of Michael Gove saying, I think people in this country have had enough of experts. And in some respects, he was right. I mean, it's a sort of, he was, he was rather jeered for saying it by some people, but he was saying something that maybe was, had uh, an element of truth about it. So these are sort of some of the things that I'm, I, I'm setting out to do, and I'm, I'm going to sort of say a little bit about how I do it. But first of all, I want to I pose a question, which I think is, gets us to the heart of something political and philosophical. And the question is, which I think we encounter the whole time in our media and in our political development at the moment, is what do we fall back on as a society when words fail us? What, do we, what is it that allows politics to still cohere, for society to still cohere, and for people to still be safe 
when people no longer understand each other, when people uh, can no longer rely on language in order to generate a common sense of society or a common sense of community. And the ultimate fear uh, in political philosophy, and it's a fear that is most famously expressed by the founder of modern political philosophy, Thomas Hobbes, is that we fall back on violence, that we fall back on uh, uh, aggression, uh, that we uh, rely on our nerves, we rely on fear, we rely on our physical bodies in order to intimidate one another or to escape one another, whatever it might be. And Hobbes' famous argument when he made this uh, in, his, in his 1651 book Leviathan was that the central function of the modern state is that it protects us from that. It allows us to live amongst one another without this kind of fallback option. That the state, by imposing a law, by creating security, by creating peace, allows people who might not have very much in common with one another to nevertheless live alongside each other. They don't even necessarily need to understand each other, let alone like each other, as long as they all fear this common force, which is the state. But I think there's a secondary question which brings us to Brexit, which is, what, does, what do we mean by the state? What is the state that we are uh, appealing to or imagining when we imagine ourselves falling back on the state? What is the language that the state itself uses? And what does the state, what language does the state use when words are no longer adequate, when democracy is no longer functioning? And I think there are two answers to this. There are two different visions of what the state is that I think we see colliding in the context of Brexit at the moment. And one is that the state is something that deals in numbers. The state thinks about the world mathematically. The state is engaged in the production of statistics, of economics. It measures how many people are coming into the country, how many people are going out, this sort of thing. And the second is that the state operates by the language of imagery, of affect, of, gra of graphical output, of uh, romantic, artistic media of music and imagery and so on. And the first of those is an ideal of the state that I would call government, and the second of those is an ideal of the state that we see as the nation state, the, nation, the national uh, community. And really, I think what we're seeing at the moment is the collision between those two different ideas of what the state fundamentally is, with all of our poor MPs day in, day out, getting caught in the crossfire uh, between these two things. So what I'm going to try and do over the next, um, uh, over the next sort of 20 minutes, 30 minutes or so, is give a kind of potted origin story of these two different ideals of what the state is, of two different ideals of what politics is, and then try and bring it back uh, to Brexit and perhaps point to some of the connections to some of these works uh, by Richard Whitby and Webb Ellis uh, as I go. So what do we mean by government? What is government? We hear talk of government the whole time, the government. But if we're going to search for uh, an origin story for government, we need to go back to the time that Hobbes was writing and others of the mid 17th century. This was a time that was famous for particular philosophical breakthroughs, particular scientific breakthroughs, when a new way of describing and encountering the world emerged in the natural sciences, in the work of people like Francis Bacon, in uh, anatomical work, uh, understanding the movement of body organs, the movement of the blood, the movement of the planet, the development of scientific experimental knowledge and so on. And it was a way of viewing the world that is encapsulated by the term that we have of objectivity, a way of holding the world up to some sort of critical inspection and to understand it according to particular geometrical, mathematical, calculated and rational uh, principles of knowledge. That the way to know what something fundamentally is, is to distance oneself from it and to apply calculus to it, to look at it mathematically. And part of the breakthrough that I explore a little bit in the book, which led to what we now recognise as government, also as maybe as technocrats, but also of experts in public life, was that for particular pioneering individuals, and again, these are just sort of some of the early pamphlets by people like William Petty and John Grant, what they recognised was that the same mentality that could be applied to the study of the planets in, above us, the stars, 
or to the human body or to nature could also be applied to the study of society, to questions of how much trade is there, how much migration is there, how much, what's the birth rate, what's the death rate. By the 20th century, people were talking about the unemployment rate or gross domestic product, these things that could become matters of fact in one kind or another. Now, statistics are fundamentally important to uh, this perspective on the world that uh, allows the society and the economy to be held up as a matter of objective truth. At the same time, you also have the development of things like newspapers, which maybe never perfectly, but which were organised at least around an ideal of reporting facts in some kind of obje objective or impartial way. And what I'm suggesting, the reason for this kind of detour into early modern political ideas, is that this in some ways is the view of politics that Remainers and the Remain campaign held on to. It takes it for granted in some respects that politics, properly understood, is a realm where facts should reign supreme, where experts should be listened to. It assumes that the world is defined by a mass of human movement, of individuals moving around, rather like sort of particles in space or planets in the universe, uh, generating a hugely complex set of social and economic developments, which only experts are really qualified to understand. The world being a fundamentally complex place, it is necessarily the case that experts of one kind or another are, rely, are required in order to deal with it. And it's also, I think, interesting to think about how, in its origins, this view of the world saw things like population growth as a fundamentally good thing, that immigration was a fundamentally good thing, that it generated uh, a, a, a flow of movement of people into society that could be seen as uh, positive. I think, as has been widely discussed, one of the divides that courses through our society now is between those with a university degree and those without a university degree. And I think that one of the difficulties that we have as a society is that this assumption, this default uh, baseline of thinking about how politics is, does and should work seems to be something that is uh, held uh, much more commonly by those with university degrees than those without university degrees. But it's always had, right from its inception, some fundamental problems. And I think it's very important for anyone who is critical of Brexit, and I'm very critical of Brexit, to try and understand what some of those are. The first is that it's never been very democratic. It's never, despite being associated with ideals of liberal democracy and, and, and so on, it rests on the assumption that most people should stay out of public life. To, to a greater extent, that they should trust others to know and report what's going on on their behalf. And where that trust breaks down, where journalists in particular and politicians uh, and other experts in public life are not viewed as acting on behalf of the public, this is fundamentally disastrous to this entire venture because it, uh, 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 the, this idea that it's possible for others to report back how things are starts to fall to pieces. And that, of course, is the other thing that we see in this populist moment, is that those who, whose job depends on acting on behalf of the public start to become seen as so-called liberal elites by figures such as uh, Nigel Farage and others. It also, of course, depends on a form of... Uh, this was... You won't actually be able to see this, so I, I don't... But this is just about um, how differently the Euro Europe is seen by those... Uh, in what, according to this survey, were called elite positions versus how it's seen by ordinary members of the public. And the most striking difference in all of this is that amongst what are called the achievements of Europe, the elites list peace far, great, far more highly than ordinary members of the public, whoever they might be. Meanwhile, amongst the failures, the uh, ordinary people view immigration and the euro as these fundamental uh, failures of uh, the European uh, project. Um, but it also, of course, depends on a form of collective progress, that everybody is part of a single community that is growing and prospering together. And where that falls down, due to forces of inequality, due to forms of regional disparities and so on, then the ability to, for those accounts of the world to cohere becomes less and less plausible. So the question that then emerges is that if 
a collective view of the world based around facts, around figures, around numbers, this mathematical view of the world that I think was taken for granted by the Remain campaign no longer seems to resonate with people. That opens up the possibility for a very different idea of what politics and what uh, collectives consists of. Now, there's a lot of history of what nations are, but it's very important first and foremost to recognize that a nation is not the same thing as a state. The second thing that I think many of the great historians of nationalism and nations such as Eric Hobsbawm and others have highlighted is that nations are founded on an original lie about their, how old they are, that they are modern creations, but they are modern creations which create various myths about their pre-modern origins and so on. Um, I think there's a huge irony when you think about this historically that actually ideals of expertise, of progress, of modernity, of technocracy and so on are actually far older historically. They date back 350 years than ideals of the nation and of nationalism, which really only date back to the early 19th century. The origins of nationalism lie in the period of the Napoleonic Wars, when you had many of the ingredients of the forms of mass collective affective community that we see uh, 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 invading our politics in various ways at the moment. And I think some of the key ingredients of this are firstly the idea that everybody shares some kind of common uh, origin, some kind of common destiny, that the nation is resolutely not reducible to facts and figures. This is fundamental to understanding some of the appeal of types of politics that seem to be devo devoid of truth or logic or rationality. And actually the, the refusal to play the game of facts, figures and rationality, I think is fundamental to how figures such as Donald Trump and others, uh, their uh, authority works. The nation has always been communicated via imagery and music more than it's been communicated via words and numbers. It's always been dependent on these non-verbal, non-logical media for, the, uh, uh, for its impact on people, not least because nations were born at a time when around half of the European public was illiterate. The ability to actually mobilize people as having some kind of common um, purpose, common destination, and so on, was inevitably dependent on the arts. But crucially also, it was dependent on the type of heroism, an ideal of leadership born often in war that uh, uh, elevated key individuals, not as uh, representatives of the public in the way that political representatives of MPs and parliamentarians or technocrats or judges would be, but those who became recognised as uh, uh, famous for their heroic acts. And this, I think, is something, as I'll say in a minute, that is re resurgent today, and I think is absolutely fundamental for understanding this political moment. Now, if we need to understand something like Brexit, I think we also need to understand in what sense nations, what is the advantage of a national idea of politics over a governmental idea of politics? And the first advantage is that nations, and it's not for those of anyone who is antagonistic to nationalism and uh, wants to avoid nationalism, this is an uncomfortable thing to consider. But nationalism has always had a democratic advantage. It involves everybody. It, well, it doesn't involve everybody, but it involves a large mass of people to an extent that liberal government and demo liberal democracy uh, is not able to do. It integrates a much wider variety of human needs and feelings and aspects of the human body than rational liberal government is able to do. It provides meaning. Ultimately, it provides something that is worth dying for. I think, crucially, at a time like this, it speaks to a sense that time is running out, that things, we are in a hurry, that we urgently need to act now uh, because uh, time is finite, that life is finite, that we need to mark the moment with a series of heroic deeds in order to rescue uh, uh, something from the past and to take it into the future. I think it, it brings the body into politics in sorts of ways that is not the case uh, under rational traditions of liberalism. Fear of one's own mortality, the aggression of mobilization uh, in a 
quasi-military fashion, perhaps in the street. It doesn't promise to tell you the truth in the sense of a set of facts, but it does promise to lead you to some kind of destination. This is a, an ideal of leadership, not an ideal of representation or an ideal of truth-telling. There's a um, phrase that I pick out in the book, which comes from one of the, uh, 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 from the um, terrifying Prussian um, military writer, Karl von Clausewitz, where he talks about how great uh, leaders in a situation of war have an ability to scent out the truth. That in situations where everything is terrifying, when everything is overwhelming, what the leader can do, which most people cannot do, is they follow their nose. That they have an ability and an instinct in order to detect what the truth is. Now, I was saying earlier about how we're at a moment where I think rather kind of uh, ancient ideals of leadership and terrorism are coming together with new technologies of uh, coordination. And I think that the, the way in which things like scenting and sniffing play out in the technological space is something that I'm quite interested in as well. Um, and um, maybe um, I could say more about. But the authority belongs to the person who will deliver glory, not to the person who will uh, deliver uh, the truth in some way. But the great fear right now and I think the fear that has always accompanied nationalism, quite rightly, is that nations have always been forged in violence in one kind or another. That either is ideals of world war, and we hear so much at the moment about what World War II represented for Britain, many false memories, many false historical claims about the type of mass mobilization, the type of mass solidarity, uh, the way in which uh, that co brought people together. There is, I think, um, part of the um, uh, romance and the fantasy of the idea of 20th century mass uh, warfare, uh, uh, modern warfare, is that it brings the civilian and the military dimensions of society into some kind of union with one another. The economy becomes mobilized around some shared purpose. It has a kind of quasi-anti-capitalist dimension, or at least an anti-market dimension, in as much as it is about bringing at things which previously were pursued purely for profit or purely for selfish motives and putting them in the service of some collective or higher end. Anti-colonial movements obviously generated their own types of nationalism with their rejection and their resistance to the forms of violence of colonial uh, leaders. And there are plenty of people like um, uh, Fintan O'Toole and others who have compared what we see with some of the rhetoric around Brexit to anti-colonial movements of the past where the claim is that Britain is now a state that has been colonized or a vassal state as Boris Johnson calls it, that some type of foreign power has taken over. This is also a crucial argument that, uh, uh, that Donald Trump was able to tap into uh, in his own political campaigning that somehow uh, Washington DC or certain types of globalist um, figures or institutions of uh, unelected powers had somehow kind of taken over control of the nation against people's wishes. And there is, I think, um, uh, one of the things which I was very struck by in uh, Richard Whitby's picks was an example which, uh, um, as was mentioned, I've written a bit about the um, Home Office um, uh, hostile environment strategies and actually some of my own interest in this kind of critique of statistical government emerged from studies of the Home Office from three years ago, where I was fascinated, and I think the film does a wonderful job of depicting it, that uh, at a certain point, the nation gets defended through this kind of conversion of governmental technologies into weapons of violence, that the types of techniques of bureaucracy, of fact-gathering, of form-filling, of asking questions, of generating uh, data, of generating numbers about people, becomes deployed not for its original aim, which was to try and track movements of people across borders um, and to optimize various outcomes and generate prosperity and so on, but instead to intimidate, to frighten, to ultimately to uh, as, as tools of violence uh, against people. And I think that's a very interesting fusion uh, of how faith in what government was once has uh, the way that's become fused with ideals of nationhood where uh, uh, the tools which were once for the regulation of movements of people uh, and in economies and societies have become used 
as weapons to punish them, as ways of trying to keep them out. And you see very similar things going on in the overhaul of the welfare state over the last 10 years, where techniques which were once used in order simply to collect data about people, in that kind of mathematical sense I was saying earlier, now are used in order to intimidate people uh, and to really spread misery a lot of the time with uh, various forms of benefit sanctions and um, uh, tests and so on. So I think the question which we have to confront at the moment and I think the, 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 the risk that we, we currently run, and I hope that this doesn't work out in the way that I'm uh, about to describe, but is that we're seeing a type of movement of the nation against government. I think that to understand the complete quagmire that Brexit is in is to understand the, uh, that for those who are on one side of the argument are appealing to something that has no factual uh, uh, reality, that has no... Uh, desire to engage with the detailed, complex, necessarily mathematical concerns of how to get goods through um, uh, trucks, through ports, and so on. Um, and that there is this mobilization of an, one idea of politics, which is organized around imagery, which is organized around common affect, which is common, organized around myth, and so on, against uh, another idea. That in some sense, we're witnessing a movement of the nation against government. And you see this, I mean, this was probably the most explicit articulation of this as an ideal that Steve Bannon uh, came out with in February 2017, where he celebrated, and it, I don't think it's come to pass, but I think it's a very clear idea of what is uh, ultimately in play here, which is that um, what he hoped Trump was going to achieve in America was what he called the deconstruction of the administrative state that there could be, by seizing some ideal of nationhood, that there could be a, a deconstruction of some ideal of government. I don't think that that is actually a realistic possibility, but I think that this is a way of understanding what's motivating some what's going on. So if Brexit is a kind of... Uh, you see similar claims that are being made by the likes of Jacob Rees-Mogg, that the Bank of England is an enemy of Brexit. You see a sense that elites have hijacked the process and it's very important to understand that elites is a term that fuses together particularly the professions of politics and journalism and the various bodies that exist in the space between them but i think politics and journalism being the absolutely key ones in this sense i think that new labor has some culpability here for producing uh, individuals who really do fuse those two types of body together in the form of people like Alistair Campbell and so on. But I think the idea that there is a single group of people with common cultural origins and common education who are operating in London via the media of the BBC, Channel 4, the newspapers uh, and government um, is something which is a very powerful one in some of the populism that we see around us at the moment. Whether government as this ideal is represented by Brussels or London or some sort of conflagration of the two, I think is really quite immaterial. And I think that some of the reaction we see is against the very idea of that type of governing. But I think that um, what we're seeing uh, instead, and this has, I think, both, uh, 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 this offers both hope and I think it also offers something potentially quite frightening, but I think which is beginning to fill the space of where uh, aspects of traditional liberal democracy are falling apart is a new politics of heroism, which I think has always been pivotal and fundamental to how nationalism has worked, but I think is drawing um, uh, uh, new powers, particularly from new technologies around us uh, today. And I think that the kinds of figures that prosper in this particular moment, and I'm not just talking about Britain, but I think uh, in, in lots of situations, they have a relationship to truth, but it's not the type of relationship to truth of those who know lots of facts, those who are experts. Instead, it's a closer to the type of truth that a whistleblower has. I think that figures, whether they be Nigel Farage blowing a whistle on the European uh, Parliament, or whether it be some idea of Donald Trump going and telling the truth about the fact that what Washington is riddled with corruption and lobbying and so on, or whether it be, uh, in a more extreme case, Tommy Robinson um, blowing the whistle on how the courts are, uh, as far as he, as he sees it, covering up certain crimes with the help of the BBC and so on. Um, the, there is a space at the moment where a certain type of heroic whistleblower 
can move into uh, a space of, of distrust and of fear much of the time uh, to tell a type of truth that is not available to those whose positions uh, are dependent on their, on their expertise in certain ways. And I think that, crucially, to understand why that is happening right now in the way that it's happening right now, we also need to pay attention to changes in our media environment, and in particular to the rise, not just of social media, that I think gets so much attention in trying to make sense of these democratic upheavals, but in particular smartphones. I think smartphones actually have, have, have play a far more important role in the transformation of our politics right now, um, in addition to the expansion of, 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 of digital bandwidth. Um, specifically because they have made photography and video the new lingua franca of democracy. So to go back to my question earlier, what, what, do, we draw, what do we fall back on when words don't work for us democratically? Increasingly, in a point where numbers, statistics and economics don't seem to tell a type of truth that many people recognise, photography, video, increasingly comes to do so. And I think that that chimes with all sorts of aspects of our political moment at this, moment, uh, at this time. I think it's significant, incidentally, that graph I put up earlier, it was from the Financial Times, but if you think about what, what is signified by these infographics, it actually tells you something rather important about the crisis that numbers are in as a means of conveying truth. That in order for numerical claims about the world to really kind of fly in this type of public sphere that we inhabit right now, they have to be made pretty in various ways. It's not just enough that they are accurate or told by experts, but the visual representation of numbers is also crucial to their ability to actually generate um, a, a common sense of reality. Now, nationalism has always been um, meme-based, effectively. So this idea that memes have come in and are generating this new type of uh, uh, kind of uh, right-wing and far-right and nationalist activity, which is undoubtedly true. But nationalism was built around flags. It was built around these images of people like Nelson and Napoleon that I put up earlier. It was built around particular songs. Um, the other thing which I think that smartphones and the ubiquity of video and photography have done to our society is to allow for everybody to uh, potentially become uh, a type of heroic truth teller or heroic whistleblower, to be able to capture what the mainstream media doesn't want you to capture, to be able to tell a story or to depict things in ways that they in the establishment don't want to be depicted, to capture what is going on before BBC Question Time actually begins for most people in the BBC, or to capture how someone looks when they're in the supermarket rather than when they want to, see, want to be seen on TV, or whatever it might be. But it's also a totally crucial condition of a new type of aggressive heroism that I think is really doing great damage to our politics at the moment, where when MPs get harassed in the street, when uh, people like Anna Subri and others um, have threats shouted against them in the street, I think one thing which is always worth remembering is there's one person doing the shouting and there's nearly always someone else holding the smartphone, capturing this as evidence that someone has had the guts in order to confront one of these corrupt elites. Without that ability to capture things in a, uh, as image, as video, uh, the, uh, the, the conditions of that type of political intervention, which has a kind of logic of heroism, uh, I think uh, is taken away. Now, more hopefully, I think that um, this is also a type of politics that we see operating at the other end of the political spectrum in relation to green politics, in relation to uh, uh, other liberal ideals, other than uh, other political ideals, other than nationalism, other than forms of intimidation and so on. If you look at how Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has used Congress in the United States, it is also quite cleverly oriented around the generation of short shareable clips of video content <laughs> that will zip around on social media, again positioning herself as a kind of heroic whistleblower going into institutions where nobody else has had the guts to tell the truth and going into them and then uh, telling the truth about them. There was also the famous example of Ellen Erson, who was uh, videoed on that flight out of 
uh, Sweden, um, in uh, refusing to leave the plane because of the uh, there were people being deported on the plane. In a sense, what this is sort of this sort of activity is doing is taking that derogatory term of virtue signalling and actually seizing it and making a virtue of virtue signalling. In as much as the capacity to actually be seen to do things, that's not to say that that's the only reason that virtuous activities are worth engaging in, but for this logic of heroism to uh, play out politically and democratically, I think that media technologies have done that in, in, in quite profound ways. So I want to just conclude by saying, I think in some ways, for whether we like it or not, this is our politics now. We can't entirely rely on numbers coming to our rescue. I personally think it's rather, although I signed the petition uh, for a second referendum, I think whether there are six million people sign that petition or five and a half, frankly, is, is, is a rather fruitless thing to, to become um, animated by as much as I understand it. I think that we live in a time where in many ways it is up to, uh, uh, to imagery, to video, to um, some of the tools that historically have been associated with the creation of um, national affective communities, but to create different type of affective communities, to produce different images of uh, people who otherwise could become uh, uh, overlooked in various ways, um, such as the young people in the Web Ellis video, to give them voice in different ways, to depict them in ways that uh, uh, precisely are not um, depicted by the mainstream media in parts of the country that previously had not been uh, 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 recognised, not been seen in various ways. I suppose finally the hope, which is always the hope of democracy, is that words will not fail us, that we can talk our way through this type of situation. And that, I think, is what, of course, is being put to the absolute limit right now. Um, but the, uh, I suppose, hope lies in the possibility that we continue to understand each other in spite of living in such, I think, radically different political ideas of what the state is and of what politics is. So I'm going to stop, stop there. Thank you.